quickly set the stage and uh, tell you about what we're trying to cover. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the need, the uh, regulations, and also in terms of some of the investments that are happening. And then I'll open it up for, uh, to the panel for questions. We'll also come back to your audience to ask you a few questions, keep your questions also ready. Uh, in terms of the need, if you look at it, uh, we have almost 72% of our rural population accessing just a third of the beds that are available, right? Versus almost 28% of the urban population having access to almost 66% uh, of the beds that are available in the country, right? Uh, if you look at government expenditure, we've spoken about that, but more important is out-of-pocket expenses. Over 70% of the expenses are out-of-pocket for uh, our population, right? Health insurance, only 10% are uh, covering that, and we've seen different challenges uh, in terms of health insurance. And uh, I have a good friend, Lena, also over here. She, in fact, spends time covering, talking to people in the slums and different areas about what, what does it mean from a coverage. But unfortunately, we have a challenge where not many people are aware of the health insurance, right? If you look at investments over the last four or plus years, almost $5 billion have come into healthcare. Uh, we'll get into some next level details of it. Last year, almost uh, 80 deals uh, got invested, almost $100 million in, uh, specifically in the healthcare space, right? From a regulations, I think many of us are familiar with it. New laws got introduced from a medical devices standpoint, and uh, recently there was an announcement about uh, the uh, healthcare parks getting set up specifically for medical devices in Andhra Pradesh, and we'll see that also extend, right? So the question to the panelists is, is affordable healthcare a myth or reality, right? I'll let Naga take it, and then uh, Samir, I would like you to take it up. The, there is this debate going around about um, this entrepreneurship, and, and a lot of people are solving uh, very nice problems. If you look at 5 billion uh, happened in the last few years, right? But 35 or billion came into investment in a, in a year. So it's a very tiny portion even going to the healthcare part. But even there, the major portion of that ends up into uh, people solving what I call in my theories on the trivial problems, right? The problems of the rich where there is no problems or the problems are very trivial. So there's not much innovations, uh, much entrepreneurship, the energy going towards solving the problem where there is a real problem is, right? And uh, so that is, that is where this affordable health, it is very fancy statement to talk about. So in the, the same conference, if you have told that it is a, a health tech conference, you'll be seeing this will be full with a lot of guys with apps, right? When he says affordable health, oh, that's not for me, right? So I'm living in Koramangla. So that, that the entire Kormangla gang is working on some app for you, me, and again, right? So that is not for the reality. But the reality is where the real problem is, as you mentioned, the numbers are very, really bad. So what is happening from the entrepreneurship side also very less. We hardly see, you know, a very few number of entrepreneurs are solving some of these serious problems. So that's where the innovation probability comes, right? If 100 people are trying, if 10 succeed, it's awesome. But only 10 tries, your 10% success rate, same probability, but you got one. What do you say? The investor will say that, okay, the affordable area is not investable worthy. So even few guys that impact investors who believe that we need to put in, who come in, also shy away. Or they get a mission drift because end of the day, an equity investor has to make money by selling his stock to someone else, right? So that means the company need to grow. So if they promise their investors, right? In, in VCs, we have a term called LP, right? If their investors have been promised huge returns, which if they are not able to provide, so they have to show some returns to their investors, they end up investing in the trending sectors, right? You could see that many of the so-called impact investors now investing in these companies and you can just take a lens and search where's the impact, right? It is just a pure market-driven things. So similarly, I think there is a big dampener happened from the country perspective, right? There's quite a bit happening about healthcare insurance and government schemes available, but still it's a very pathetic stage. The number one reason the poor goes to poverty is the healthcare expenses, right? The breadwinner uh, has a problem, you are in trouble. Look at my, my driver, right? 
So he has a debt with me around one and a half lakhs in the last two years. He spent money on his um, mother's expense and he had some health issues. So last one month he just disappeared. Because last time he spoke to me was that my wife had some stomach problem. So I couldn't reach and I sent people to look at his house. Nobody's there in the house. So he's afraid to ask me more money and he's disappeared. I don't know where he is, right? So this is the reality of, of that. You know, this happening in somebody in Bangalore, right? So this is the problem that healthcare expense put him in a debt forever and it is pushing him again hard and harder. But are we not we are not able to solve. So all these insurances and all that, that may not be the way to go because he prefers not to go to even government hospitals. Recently, the IM students have done a study around immigrant population. So I, I, I heard a story that uh, somebody from Jammu Kashmir sitting there in Nimhans for one month for an appointment with the doctor. A family, right, sitting in Nimhans for one month. The family is sleeping outside. This guy goes around, makes some errands, makes some money, and feeds them. So this is the reality of it, yeah? So it is, it's not there yet. But what happening, we are all investors are all going towards is investing in these companies, which is solving the rich people problem. That's where the money is. So, thanks, Nanga. So while we have different schemes trying to remove poverty, every year we drive almost a million people below the poverty line because of healthcare issues. Samir, what's your take on affordable healthcare? Is it a myth or a reality? Sure. So I think the panelists, uh, I mean, uh, specifically Dr. Sujata, has already covered uh, something very important in the earlier session. Uh, basically, what do we mean by affordable health care is something that we have to really think hard. Uh, we have a situation where uh, a villager goes to a quack, gives about, uh, let's say, 20 rupees or 30 rupees and gets some colored medicines. Uh, and uh, God knows what, ends up later in the tertiary healthcare system uh, with a very serious problem which has not gotten addressed at the initial stage, ends up getting into a poverty cycle, ends up uh, into a debt trap, and then eventually uh, the whole thing is termed as unaffordable. Now, very importantly, if we can address this at an early stage, this problem could possibly have been eliminated there itself and at much lower cost overall, uh, both for the patient and for the system. Uh, but for doing that, are we really, uh, are, do we really have correct perceptions of uh, quality health care uh, at appropriate stage? So when I talk to villagers, and we, we work in the rural health care and uh, at, through telemedicine in specific uh, E or M health care kind of a, a scenario, when I talk to villagers saying, I can give you this at 50 rupees, a good quality uh, doctor who can actually diagnose your problem, who can actually give you correct medicines, and the whole thing is traceable because there is a record when you go to the next stage, people know what has been done to you or what you have gone through in the past. Uh, uh, it gets compared with this 20 rupees and a quick kind of a solution. and. People don't even, when they travel to, uh, let's say, a district hospital or a, or a taluka place for uh, getting uh, an appointment with a doctor, it, the travel time, the, the time of lost wages, etc., doesn't even get counted in the comparison. The quality, it's not that the villager doesn't know what quality uh, healthcare is uh, being uh, offered by this local quack or uh, uh, some sort of a health provider. But they still prefer going there because it seems to be, uh, it seems to be considerations, not necessarily uh, quality in what we uh, would probably define as in the medical perspective of the treatment, but various other other factors. And so that that becomes we we did also a survey on uh, at some point of time on the perceived quality of healthcare. And we were very surprised to know that a very highly qualified doctor uh, uh, providing a consultation versus a local quack providing a consultation, the perception of quality in the patient's mind was very different. So, so, uh, so essentially, affordable healthcare, when we talk about, we need to really see what we mean by affordable, at what stage we need to bring in the infrastructures, the regulations, all of those things put in in a consistent manner so that we then start making this a reality. 
today i would say it's it's so really really sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, in the interest of time uh, i have a question for paul and karuna and one request is you'll have to keep your answers a little brief so paul and karuna you folks have been uh, investing for a while right so what have you seen any game changers in terms of your investments which ones amongst your investors are further down the line karuna you want to go first so for us the work we do which is working with the aspiring poor people who earn between 7 to 8000 rupees a month family income to 20000 everything that we are doing there uh, fundamentally is game changing because nobody has treated this segment as customers <coughs> till now and we uh, the first phase of our investing in healthcare was mostly around physical service delivery companies uh, and we've seen a lot of uh, successes in that space. We have an investment in a chain of am ambulances, largest in the country, 3,000 ambulances today and we've proven that it's a financially viable business. Uh, similarly, uh, maternity, uh, we have a chain of hospitals which call LifeSpring which provides uh, deliveries at 7,000 rupees for a normal delivery and 15,000 rupees for a C-section. Again, uh, Sustainable uh, has about 12% market share in Hyderabad, arguably, again, one of the largest maternity uh, chains in the country. So uh, we've definitely seen successes. Unfortunately, since this is an untested customer segment, it will take longer initially uh, to get to success. Market is unlimited, but how do you access the market and costs of accessing this market is what we have to figure out. Sure. Paul, your views? Yeah, I think, so we make investments with the assumption or the belief that we've convinced ourselves that these things are game changing. So we start there and I'd say, you know, Vilgro is a incubator and very early stage investor. So we're, most of our companies are still in product development. Uh, to give one example of one of our companies that actually is selling a very simple product, which is a uh, neonatal temperature monitoring bracelet. It alerts the mother to hyperthermia. Um, the, in their, their trials to validate that it's functioning correctly, they're catching cases of neonatal hypothermia in neonatal ICUs. So let alone, the device is intended to go home with the especially at risk babies um, and they're definitely there's they're starting to capture evidence in the home setting they started in the the NICUs just to make sure that they were you know sending home a device that was safe they have more data there but they're seeing um, increased weight gain in the baby better developmental milestones some incident um, evidence that they're catching sepsis early and getting babies back to the hospital so that it can be treated effectively. So a very simple product that can have significant uh, impacts on the outcomes for those children because those, you know, those first 30 days are critical for the mental development of the baby moving forward. Thanks. So we have a question for you in terms of, uh, you've been in this journey, it's been a struggle, right? And uh, what really are the pains that you go through? How difficult is it to get an investment from our friends sitting next to you. <laughs> You're getting me started. <laughs> okay, so uh, as I already mentioned, we work in the primary care and rural and that two technology. It's, it's been a very difficult uh, part of uh, life to raise investments. So that, that is something that I would uh, like to share. We had to meet more than 85, 85 can you believe it he's met 85 and i don't know how many days that has been right? <laughs> and a lot of them uh, also uh, most of them are social investors uh, impact investors so um, uh, so we're sorry quick interruption one line on your solution so that people understand the context okay so so we basically uh, help setting up uh, centers in the villages which uh, work uh, to connect village uh, patients with the with the doctors remotely uh, in some uh, in some sense telemedicine but uh, in the limited uh, skill set and resource settings as well as uh, a widespread screening ma mass screening of the populations which uh, which helps uh, in uh, epidemiology and various other things uh, so uh, we have a platform called remedy remote medical diagnostics which allows this which is a combination of diagnostics uh, point of care diagnostics medical records and a low bandwidth video audio conferencing combined with workflows that's what we do so so it has been extremely difficult uh, raising investment for this we i i would claim to have about 2200 
village centers at this point of time in India and a few other countries, mostly uh, in India, in the northern states of UP and Bihar, but also uh, around 10 states. Uh, a lot of people consider rural and primary care as a government problem. They think private companies should not be getting into this uh, because it's a public health issue and government should spend and is mandated to spend. Uh, plus, the, the remaining part of it uh, is also that there are very few uh, implementation agencies who work at scales. There are, there are lakhs of NGOs in India and very few of them actually can implement meaningful projects at some scale. Most of them implement very small initiatives. So how do you actually scale this program without government is a very big question that a lot of investors do find difficult to answer. And uh, there are many such things, but I'll, I'll limit so, it to that. Naga and Karuna, so one of you has invested in some years company, one of you hasn't, right? What really are the struggles and why is it that, is it that the solution is not right? Is it ahead of time or what, what is the issue in terms of funding? So from my end, couple of things, uh, one- and It's not specific to- Yeah, 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 sure. You can give so a while we talk of healthcare having attracted so much investment in medtech having attracted so much investment, if you really look at medtech deals, uh, most of the action is sub $250,000. $250,000 to $20 million, there's no action. So people invest in product, uh, product stage, product development stage, but once the prototype is ready and you have to go into validation, the validation phase, uh, very few people are willing to take risk. They wait till commercialization. So the market itself, uh, investors have very limited appetite for, and uh, sometimes it's not about the product alone. It's about what it will take for the product to succeed. As he said, uh, He's a product company. It needs implementation partners. Will they, with, will private entities be interested in this? Will government be interested in this? Uh, fine, you provide a teleconsultation. Where will the guy get medicines from? Diagnostics around it. So, it's uh, sometimes a larger problem that needs to be solved, and which is why investors' appetite can get limited as well. Uh, but yeah. Let, let me interrupt you for a minute, right? So there are three million NGOs in the country. And many, many of them are, uh, in fact, we work with NGOs. Many of them are looking at innovative solutions. Unfortunately, I think we don't have a platform where we bring the likes of Samir's organization. And I know there is Gita also sitting over here somewhere. I don't know where she is. Number of innovative solutions uh, which are not getting exposed to NGOs. Right? So, Naga, what's your view on this? Yeah, the one is uh, the, the number of solutions are very minimum, right? As, as I mentioned earlier, there's quite a bit of health-related innovation happening, which is purely they think that you put an app, you will have all the problems solved. But the, the problem is across the board, right? You start from preventive health care to, you know, diagnostics and then action. In the action, three levels, primary, secondary, tertiary. So all these levels, we need interventions, right? All these levels, we need affordable way of doing things. So there is this one step towards identification of it, right? But deploying this identification, yes, we need to figure out the models. Like Samir worked with uh, WHP, there's an NGO that's putting up in North, uh, North, uh, North of India. So I would, I would say that still we need more innovation. I, I stick to my point earlier is that one is uh, the entrepreneur need to be encouraged more and more coming to solving this problem because there is one billion people we are ignoring. So the entire country is ignoring the one billion which have a serious problem. It's all busy solving the problem of 250 million which has internet access. So the government also sending a very bad signal to all of them. Uh, the earlier government started this fund called uh, Inclusive Innovation Fund. It was a billion dollar fund. It was supposed to go for inclusive innovations. This government completely scrapped it, bumped it up with 10,000, which is fantastic. But most of the money is going to the guys who are writing apps the investors who are supporting those guys. So which is sending clearly signals to the entire generation of entrepreneurs jumping in, which is fantastic, right? The whole country is buzzed with entrepreneurship activity. It's a cool to say I'm an entrepreneur, right? Probably getting bride and groom is getting easier. But this crowd has all been encouraged to go solve a trivial problems. So this government, this 10,000 crore fund, completely gone, problematic. And also, which is maybe one issue of it, but if that some encouragement comes, there's more and more investors which 
with the what we call patient capital could be available which could solve this problem. Thanks, Ranga. Paul, question for you. Uh, you've, you have an interesting set of portfolio and you invest at the early stage. What really is the criteria while you make those investments? Yeah, our criteria are pretty simple. Um, it's are you, uh, we look, start by talking really with doctors and understanding if the entrepreneur is pitching to us a problem that the doctors actually feel um, in their day-to-day -day practice. Um, if the answer to that is yes, and we get you know, some validation that the technical approach to solving that real pain point for the doctors um, is you know, valid, that it's scientifically viable. Um, and I, I guess I should back up and say that we, when we look at these problems, we always look with the lens that is this a um, you know a, a big um, problem for India's poor um, you know increasingly uh, I think as we were talking about the those the um, the NCDs are creeping into the lower segments of society um, maybe not the lowest but definitely lower um, and we're seeing those as big problems in addition to communicable disease. So we, we look, is it a big problem for India's poor? Do doctors actually feel this as a pain in treating the patient effectively? Um, is it scientifically valid? We don't fund basic scientific research. And then do we like the people that are, are trying to make it work? And if, if we, the answers to those questions are yes, then we generally go forward with the investment. Thanks, thanks. So for those of you who are looking into new ideas, startups, etc., you can meet them during the lunch session. They are available, so feel free to catch up. I'll cover the next section in, uh, on regulations, policies, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, so Samir, question for you. With the recent uh, regulations, recent budget, etc., there is a good amount of support for startups. Uh, also the new medical devices policy that has come up, we've seen the cost of stents going down uh, significantly. What does it really mean for innovators such as you and impact investors, right? So maybe you take the invest, uh, innovator angle and I'll let the investors take the other angle. Sure. So uh, that's actually a very important question uh, for the segment. Uh, firstly, uh, having a regulated market space is very good because it gives a level playing field. Otherwise, it's like uh, apples versus oranges and nobody knows the difference. Uh, however, having said that, a uh, lot of regulations uh, make the space exclusive, which is if the cost of uh, uh, complying to that regulation is very difficult or very high, then you are obviously eliminating a lot of startups or you are increasing the cost of innovation, thereby impacting the overall affordability in the space. So we had this uh, issue with the continua kind of uh, specification, interoperability specification. The entry fee there itself was so high that we ended up saying it would be exclusive. The uh, second problem with such regulations uh, being exclusive is that India is not a uniform or a monolith kind of a space. So when you make regulations, uh, keeping in mind secondary tertiary space, the primary space may get very adversely affected. Uh, one of the examples was the earlier telemedicine guideline that was put to the uh, ministry which said particular standards for video audio conferencing or particular standards for medical devices have to be maintained. Now that is obviously not possible because you don't have the bandwidth to take that kind of a solution to the rural areas. So you are thereby eliminating a lot of people who could get benefited potentially. So uh, the regulation has to, has a very key role to play uh, in being inclusive. Thirdly, uh, the costs. So we have been dealing with various labs, specifically for our devices, our kind of devices, certification and so on. And it seems that it is exorbitant, like anybody's rate, anybody's guess what kind of costs would uh, you know, happen to be uh, uh, incurred uh, in the process of uh, getting regulatory compliances. And then um, there are different views from different labs if you take the same product in terms of uh, what would the costs be. Uh, nobody seems to know an accurate yes or no uh, answers in many of the cases because the devices tend to break the, um, uh, the traditional model of uh, certifications, etc. The new use cases are completely different given the scenario of usage in India is completely different. So uh, then there is an additional aspect I would like to bring which is not even covered by these kind of regulations which is an accreditation of the processes itself. 
Now we have these uh, and an interesting experience when we said, okay, let's talk about accreditation of processes uh, of primary healthcare through technology and telemedicine. There were no takers. The same people who were very uh, enthusiastic about the hospital accreditations and so on would not take up the cause for the accreditation of processes for primary healthcare simply because it was to be a challenge or it was not to be monetized enough. And so those are kind of things that we need to deal with. Thanks. For those of you who are interested in the regulations, the draft policies are out and they will get formally rolled out by Jan 2018. So this is the time to share your inputs. Naga, with that question to you, Karnataka top funded state in the last year. Is it because of passionate people, right policies or no policies or is it because of the ecosystem? Yeah, I think it's from the, probably it's coming from this IT boom, right? There is quite a bit of uh, uh, IT related activity happened, no? When IT boom happened also, government had not much to do with that. Right? Maybe an STPA was one area, small one. But similarly, what is happening is today, there's this entire uh, population which was paid very well, and they got their basic necessities taken care to an extent. Now they are reaching a plateau, you know, glass ceiling, or the IT industry not growing very well. So they're able to come out and solving these problems, right? So that is what putting Bangalore a little ahead because what they've learned last 20 years doing coding, they're able to apply it to a completely different perspective. So I would not probably, now government is catching up, right? Even the entire startup policy, even the India government started only last year. But you know, uh, we've been investing last 12 years. You know, Acumen has been there 15 years. So, so this is probably government is catching up, which is, which is what government is good for. Government cannot innovate, but what government could do is it could scale the innovation which is successful. I think uh, in that angle, I'm pretty happy, but there has to be inclusiveness which is not there. I'll, I'll just quickly draw a parallel into the banking sector, right? So there is a uh, you know uh, regulator, RBI, then you have this provider, payer, your SBI. So last 10 plus 15 years, the banks have been told to go to rural area, right? Inclusive bankable people, they never went, you know, they tried all kind of stuff. So what the regulator did, went to a people who were already in the rural area, like a Banthan bank, got a bank license. So instead of telling SBI go to bank and you know go to people who are already in the rural area become make a bank. So that could be a similar thought process could happen in the regulatory framework in the healthcare as well. Government need to figure out that am I a regulator, am I a provider, am I a payer. So pick an area and encourage more innovations to a level so that what happened to Bandhan Bank could happen to Neurosynaptic, right? It, that'll open up more and more opportunity. 